The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There may be spoilers. This episode is scripted, narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 93, in which we will be looking at how El Akhrera and his people obtain their evolutionary blessings according to the most up-to-date scientific evidence. A bit of a diversion from our usual material, this one, but as a science advocate, I couldn't help myself. Inevitably, this will mean I'll be referring extensively to the theories of abiogenesis, evolution by natural selection, and plate tectonics. That is to say, the best explanation science currently has for the origin of life, how life then diversified into different species, and the formation and reformation of continents on which that happened for land-based life. However, I will not be addressing any role Frith or any other deity may or may not have played in any of the above. For reference, I have relied heavily on the excellent book The Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins, which I utterly recommend. However, from my research that does not involve shared human ancestry, I have had to lean heavily on good old Wikipedia, as well as the incredible website onezoom.org forward slash life. Again, I seriously recommend it. There will be links in the notes. But first, following last week's episode, Sean Higgins has added a few thoughts in the YouTube comments that are worth mentioning here, as he really does know the ABC 1984 play Inside Out. He makes the interesting point that the other rabbits, except for Hazel and maybe Bigwig, laugh at Fiverr before they enter the warren of the snares. Yet in the book, the laughter of the rabbits there is disturbing to them. Also, where I mentioned Silver seeming to take on some of Blackberry's role, Sean also thinks that Dandelion takes on some of his role. Sean is also sure that the actor who played Fiverr also played the mouse. Generally, the cast of this place seemed to have been a small company with actors taking on other small roles. Sean went into some detail about the decline of spoken radio in North America. Here in the UK, we are rather spoiled with such stations as BBC Radio 4, though I think the rise of the podcast is where the future of radio lies. There is still a great appetite for sound-only media, as you are demonstrating right now by listening to this. One aspect of the play I did not comment on was the music, which Sean pointed out is very atmospheric at times, while I think the main theme had a medieval vibe. Having commented so much on the music of the 1978 film, I really should have at least mentioned it. Anyway, with all that said, let's start our epic story of how we think El Ajara really received his blessing. The Story of the Evolution of Elechrera Part 1 Our Shared Ancestry with Rabbits If you accept the theory that life on Earth began about 3.7 billion years ago, as the geological record appears to show, then humans and rabbits share the exact same evolutionary story for 98% of the time life has existed on Earth. During those billions of years, our ancestors are their ancestors. All of them. The spirit of Elechera, the ultimate survivor, was present from the start, for survival until reproduction is the very essence of evolution. Suffice to say that at some point, the first living cell, probably a strand of RNA in a lipid shell, managed to survive for long enough to reproduce itself. From this primitive and tenuous start, the eukaryotic cell that makes up all multicellular organisms eventually evolved. The first larger multicellular organisms would have been primitive worms. From these, after they divided from those who would eventually evolve into insects, evolved the first vertebrate fish, about 518 million years ago, during the Cambrian explosion, a period of rapid diversification of species. By about 375 million years ago, during the Devonian period, the first fish were adapting to life on land. Then, 310 million years ago, during the second half of the Carboniferous period, an egg-laying lizard-like creature was living on the newly formed supercontinent of Pangaea. Once this single global continent had formed, its interior would have been an extremely harsh desert environment. This creature was the last ancestor that both we and rabbits share with the ancestors of Kihar the seagull, Hawk the pheasant and all other birds, including air-based Alil. Their ancestors and close relations would go on to evolve into the dinosaurs, who may very well have been more feathered than conventional images of them suggest, as bones fossilise a lot more easily than feathers. Anatomical features of dinosaurs, along with more recent fossils of primitive birds who had teeth, have caused a rethink as to how these creatures may have appeared. To illustrate this, 
How would you reconstruct a turkey or a chicken based purely on how they look when bought as food, devoid of feathers? Over the next 225 million years, as the dinosaurs reach supremacy, our shared ancestor with rabbits evolved into one of the earliest mammals, its scales gradually thinning to the first fur, some of its newly developed sweat glands adapting to produce the first milk for its young. As an early mammal, it was still an egg layer, as the duck-billed platypus still is. And, as the dinosaurs grew larger, our shared ancestor, the primitive Elechrera, may have spent much of its life tending to its eggs in a burrow. Then, about 140 million years ago, at the beginning of the Cretaceous, our ancestor abandoned egg-laying and became the first marsupial, giving birth at a very early stage in gestation and suckling their young to maturity. In the absence of a pouch, this would probably have had to involve the use of a shelter such as a burrow. At this time, the beginnings of what we would recognise as our continents were beginning to form. One of these was Australia, where marsupials went on to survive, notably in isolation, though they were replaced almost everywhere else. Out on, about 105 million years ago, our ancestor became the, became the first placental mammal, meaning that this gestation took a lot longer and young could be born more independent, and placental mammals rapidly became the dominant kind. This smaller creature, in a far more forested world, probably resembled a shrew and ate insects, an ideal niche in a world now fully dominated by dinosaurs. 85 million years ago, in the Upper Cretaceous, a similar creature was our last common ancestor with most mammals. This happened on the continent, continent of Laurasia, which was made up of what would become North America, Europe and Asia. This was Elecherar's last common ancestor with all land-based allil, as well as those animals that humans would one day farm. So, this is the last common ancestor Elecherar shared with Yona the Hedgehog, as well as all Lendry, Homba, cats and dogs. Part 2. The End of Our Shared Ancestry with Rabbits 75 million years ago, also in the Upper Cretaceous, there lived a creature that was the last common ancestor Elechera shared with all lemurs, monkeys and apes, including humans. As humans, these creatures were approximately our 15 million greats-grandparents. That applies as much to you as it does to me. They, like all the ancestors mentioned in this episode so far, are equally related to all humans. And they are the last direct link that allows us to call rabbits our cousins. From this point forward, the story of Elechera is no longer our story. Then about 73 million years ago, having probably developed the unique ever-growing front teeth that they have retained ever since, Elechera bade farewell to his last common ancestor with all rodents. 63 million years ago, a huge meteor struck the earth, wiping out almost all dinosaurs. Those smaller dinosaurs that survived would go on to become the birds we know today. They were the first whisperings of Kiha. Who knows when the first yark was first heard in that post-apocalyptic world. Our ancestors at that time would still have been a small shrew-like creature, but not now the same species as the primitive Elechera. Meanwhile, the shrew-like creature that Elechera had been for a long time now was free to grow in size in a world suddenly emptied of a lot of competition. But Elechera was still yet to receive his blessing. First, he had to say goodbye to the last of his short-eared ancestors, those who would go on to evolve into the close relative of rabbits known as Pikas, who now live in Asia and North America. I did think this creature was possibly the inspiration for the Pokemon Pikachu, but apparently that was based on a squirrel. Pikas are the closest nature currently provides to the creature Elechera might have been before his blessing. If you're not familiar with them, look them up. They are very cute. About 53 million years ago, during the Paleogene period, possibly in what would become more North America, the ancestors of Pikas split from those who had become the first long ears, the Leporidae. At that time, our primitive ancestors were also those of lemurs, as we evolved towards becoming the first monkeys. It is during the period that followed that Elechera began to receive his blessing from Frith. By 24 million years ago, also during the Paleogene period, his blessing was complete at which time our monkey ancestors were in the process of losing their tails and becoming the first apes. 
For it is at this time that the last common ancestor of all rabbits and all hares lived, probably in Asia. So we know that by this time all the features that rabbits and hares have in common had probably developed. It took nearly 30 million years. That's a long time to leave your bottom sticking out of a burrow while Frith blesses it, so I suspect it may have involved instead the development of those characteristics that enabled these creatures to evade predators. For the mammalian Elil had truly arrived by now. After this time, it is more or less correct to refer to Elachera as a rabbit. Part 3 Rise of the Long Ears 21 million years ago, the species that would go on to become the North American cottontails became a distinct species. They are more distantly related to hares than the European rabbit, and their closest relation is the North American pygmy rabbit. By this time, our ancestors were the first apes. Then, nearly 20 million years ago, the European rabbit emerged, probably around the Iberian Peninsula, modern-day Spain and Portugal, though with a range that would include Western France and North Africa. Its range would have varied as ice ages came and went. The superficial similarity of cottontails and European rabbits is an example of convergent evolution, as they are both far more closely related to rabbit species that look far less like them than they are to each other. In the case of the European rabbit, these are three species from the Himalayas, Japan and the southern Cape of Africa, reflecting the fundamental evolutionary division between the so-called old and new worlds by this time. This is an excellent example of the kind of evidence that only genetics can provide. So maybe the authors of the North American-based RPG Bunnies and Burrows got it right when they didn't use the Lapine language. For Native American rabbits, it would, in reality, be utterly alien. By 6,000 years ago, hares had crossed the land bridge that connected Britain to the rest of Europe, becoming the native mountain hare when the English Channel and North Sea were flooded at the end of the last Ice Age. But the European brown hare and European rabbit never did cross that land bridge, unlike our now fully human dark-skinned ancestors. For light skin in European humans did not appear as soon as we arrived in colder, less sunny parts of the world, Genetic evidence suggests that it, it was actually marginal vitamin D deficiencies caused by the agricultural revolution that caused light skin to develop after humans first arrived in Britain, as well as the rest of Europe. There are now eight distinct species of rabbit around the world, though in places the naming distinction between rabbits and hares seems to be quite blurred. Six of these have a very limited range and several are endangered. The American cottontails are thriving in North, South and Central America, but only one, the European rabbit, has managed to spread to two other continents, South America, where they are wild in Chile, and Australia, having been introduced to both continents by humans in the 19th century during the age of European imperialism. For this is where our human story rejoins that of rabbits, as we begin to not only hunt them as members of the Allil, but also to increase their range and appearance by farming and breeding them. In both continents, the spirit of the children of Elachera, once almost free from Elil, has become all too apparent, as this does not stop them from breeding, well, like rabbits. In the end, in these circumstances, it is only disease that seems to control their numbers, such as the dreaded white blindness, whether by accident or human design. But now let's take this back to the island of Britain, the setting of Watership Down. Until recently... It was thought that rabbits did not reach Britain until the Normans brought them here from France a thousand years ago. But recent archaeological evidence indicates that it may be the Romans who first brought them here for food, along with the brown hare, 2,000 years ago. Unsurprisingly, the children of Elachera did not stay caged for very long. I was going to end this historical part of our tale with the proliferation of over 300 breeds of domesticated rabbits, all descendants of European rabbits, such as the short-haired black angoras Laurel and Clover, or the black and white Himalayans Boxwood and Haystack, three of whom escaped from Nuthanger Farm into the wild in Watership Down. But the simple fact is that all British wild rabbits are the descendants of Roman hutch rabbits who were carried across the English Channel 2,000 years ago. Every single one of them. What tales those first British rabbits could tell.
During the 2,000 years rabbits have proliferated on this island, they have been known by various names such as bunny or coney. Even the word rabbit has been variously rendered as rabbage or rappet in the west country and rapid in the north. The root of the word is Belgian. Coney was an earlier English term that, than rabbit originating in France, while the word bunny seems to come from Saxon Old English. The word warren originated from an Anglo-Norman term defining an area in which a subject of the king could freely hunt certain animals within a defined area. One of these creatures, of course, was the rabbit. In 1964, a British naturalist published a book based upon his extensive research into the behaviour of rabbits in Britain. The book was called The Private Life of the Rabbit, and its author was R. M. Lockley. You may have heard of it. Next time, we start to look at some tales from Watership Down. <laughs>